Hello, hello, hello. This is Terry Edwards, uh, Renegade Recruiter, and welcome to another interview. Uh, of course, we're joined by Drew, and our guest this week is Stephen O'Donnell. Now, a lot of you... Oh, hi, Stephen. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. A lot of you know Stephen from, uh, from Nora, and Stephen's very much a, uh, an advocate for, for, for job hunters. So it's a real pleasure to have you on the interview, Stephen. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Terry. It's good to be here. Good to see you and Drew. Yeah, a real pleasure. So, look, for those that don't know you, there aren't, there aren't many in the industry that don't know you, just give an overview of who you are, what you do, and who you serve, please, Stephen. If, if anyone doesn't know me, then, then shame on you. Uh, but uh, you can find me on, on, on any of the social media platforms under Stephen O'Don. So on Twitter, that's what you'll get me, and the exact same on every other platform. Uh, but I've been in recruitment since 1987. Uh, I started when I was 12. Uh, and uh, actually, I wrote a, I wrote a blog just uh, earlier this week, well, an article on LinkedIn talking about what I did before recruitment because, well, I started in recruitment. It seems to me late, but I was 21. But before that, I I'd, had a couple of jobs that really kind of teed me up for it. Uh, and uh, w one was working in, in hotels uh, for a couple of summer seasons. Uh, one was uh, uh, selling uh, telesales of advertising in trade magazines. Another was selling cable TV at to pe into people's houses. And the last day, selling fax machines before fax machines caught on. Now, you might think fax machines are old hat, but I was there before they were even new hat. Uh, and, uh, and that teed me up perfectly for a job in recruitment because I'm a born nosy parker. And I love speaking to people and I, find, I love finding out about people's stories and what makes them tick. Uh, and the area that I recruited in was always manufacturing, engineering and some sales. Uh, and uh, and I, I found a niche in the plastic injection molding sector. Uh, and finding a niche is always a great thing to do as a recruiter. But as I say, I'm not an engineer. I'm not any way technical in, in that sense. But what I was able to do was learn to be a very good judge of character uh, and to enable people to open up and tell me about themselves. So I always found that to be the way in to the person to find out about them as a character. And the more I knew them, the more I trusted them as a candidate, then the more I could believe what they're telling me about how good they were in whatever discipline they worked in. Uh, so that was, that was my route into recruitment in 1987, as I say. The world of recruitment has uh, tumbled uh, several times uh, uh, since then. Uh, there's been, uh, you know, uh, job-centric and candidate-centric markets. There's been ups and downs. There's been the millennium bug. There's been all sorts. Uh, and, of course, social media and, uh, and, and job boards. So I switched from, well, it was a kind of gradual switch, but I switched from running a recruitment agency uh, in 99, 2000, to set up a website called alljobsuk.com, which was, it came about basically because I set up a website for my own agency and thought there must be an online directory of all the agencies in the country. There must be a list. So if I was a job seeker, how could I find the agency that was best for me? And the more I looked, uh, the more I, uh, I couldn't find one. I thought, well, I'll just, I'll build it. Uh, so I built that website, All Jobs UK, which was a database of every single job board in the country, every single employer, and every single recruitment agency. Uh, we also had a database of individual recruitment consultants, maybe about 10 or 12,000 recruitment consultants so that candidates could find the recruiter that was an expert in their field. And oh, from, okay. from, from that sprung the Online Recruitment Awards. So at the very beginning, I make no bones about it, the National Online Recruitment Awards was a marketing exercise. I thought with a new, a new website to promote, uh, it would be nice to win an award, but the next best thing to winning an award is giving out awards. Uh, so if we give it awards for the best recruitment agencies, employers, and job boards, uh, then each of these companies that are successful and win, they'll have marketing departments and they'll shout to the world about it. And Absolutely. by reflection, we would get some attention. And of course, the Noras yeah. grew arms and legs. Uh, and this will be the 20th year of the Noras this year. So it's, 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 a, uh, it's a big year for, uh, for, for the Noras all around. Uh, th that website was sold in 2007. And I've been doing, since then, I've been doing a variety of uh, consultancy work, almost entirely to do with uh, uh, online, uh, uh, online recruitment uh, and mixing in with the, the, the Noras in that time. So whether it be uh, psychometric assessments or uh, consultancies with uh, job boards and agencies and employers. Uh, and uh, as, as I was saying earlier, uh, I've been doing some work oh, this year, sorry, point the right way. Uh, <laughs> with uh, uh, Video My Job. So all of last year working with Video My Job and Video My Job are very much at the forefront of uh, enabling uh, companies to give a much more uh, detailed insight to candidates on what they do and how they do it and to engage with candidates in a much more uh, human way. Uh, and that's what really attracted me. When I found out about Video My Job, I thought 
this is going to change everything. Uh, more and more so companies these days are expecting candidates to take part in video interviews uh, that are asymmetric. Uh, they'll send out the link, they'll ask the candidate to record an interview, answering questions on this, that and the other. Uh, but the company doesn't share uh, videos of themselves. The hiring manager doesn't go on video to tell the candidate about the job, the company, the prospects and so on. Uh, and that's what candidates want. Candidates want insight. Candidates are, because the, the, the unemployment rate is historically the lowest it's been for a long time. Uh, and that doesn't mean that everyone's got a job or everyone's got the job that they want, but it does mean that candidates are more in control than they have been. So candidates, especially with online uh, facilities, now candidates are able to be fussier than ever before. And yeah. candidates are able to research companies much more than ever. They want to know more. Whenever I buy something off Amazon, uh, and as you might tell by things behind me, I do like a gadget. Uh, I always research, I always dig up all the information, I look at the reviews and I decide what to buy and then I find out where's the cheapest buy place to buy it. Now candidates in the same way are uh, researching any organisation they're going to work with. You can absolutely bet if a candidate goes along to see a company, they've looked up the website, they've looked up the LinkedIn yeah. profile of the person who's going to interview them, they're going to look up yeah. the LinkedIn profile of anyone who previously worked there. Uh, so if, if, if candidates are doing that, then organizations who are forward thinking should be getting ahead of that and, and presenting the candidate with information and being able to take charge of that conversation to an extent by sharing the information up front uh, and, and not necessarily trusting that the candidate will find everything they would hope they would find uh, when they run the research. Yeah, crikey, you've, you've covered quite a bit there. Let's, let's go back to your, I'm, I'm, let's go back to what you said at the beginning. You entered recruitment in 1987, just to let you know, Stephen, uh, Drew wasn't even born then, so he, he, <laughs> you know, and he, he probably doesn't even know what a fax is, you know, which is, uh, <laughs> which is, uh, but just very quickly, Stephen, how long were you in recruitment for? Uh, well, the, 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 strictly speaking, I still have a recruitment agency. Yeah, sorry, called, I mean, as a recruiter, my apologies, yeah. As a, as a hands-on recruiter, well, the last, so I make the occasional accidental placement. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, old candidates or clients come up and I'll, I'll make a placement. And, sometimes, and you get that buzz, of course. Uh, when you make a placement, you think, yes, I could do this all the time. Uh, but uh, the truth is, is you can't, you can't recruit unless you're doing it full-time. You can't do it part-time at all because if you try and part-time recruit, you'll find the right candidate after everyone else has found the right candidate and there are no fees in being second uh, to, uh, to, to, to find that person. So... Uh, uh, I've not recruited formally for maybe maybe 10 years now. Okay. Uh, but uh, s still very much in the sector. In fact, so a couple of years ago, I was doing, uh, in 2018, I was doing a lot of work with Pocket Recruiter. Uh, do you know Pocket Recruiter at all? I know the name. Are they digital recruiters? <laughs> Pocket Recruiter is a, an AI-based uh, uh, search and, and, and matching platform. Uh, okay. In the UK, it's run by Felix Vetzel. Uh, Felix used to uh, be the marketing director with uh, a job site and various other companies. Uh, but uh, essentially, it's a tool that allows uh, recruiters, in, mainly in agencies, but also in-house, to uh, search through multiple databases, might be job boards, might be their own database, might be LinkedIn and Indeed, to find candidates and match them and learn from the patterns of behavior of the recruiters what they what they recognize as, as good looks like. Uh, anyway, I was doing a lot of work with, uh, with, with Pocket Recruiter uh, and uh, uh, from a, a technology point of view, uh, was you know, just blown away with the possibilities of that. Okay, okay, excellent, excellent. So I just want to go, um, again, probably just digging a bit to recruit. You've, you've been in the industry since 1987. From yeah. your point of view, and you made a really good point, the changes that have been uh, over those What's that, 30 odd years, bloody hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what have you seen as being the biggest changes for both the recruiter and the candidates over, over those years? That, that perhaps, because I know there's been a lot of obvious changes, but that, that probably candidates or more so and, and recruiters don't appreciate. What would you say they are, the changes that, that, people, that, that are not necessarily appreciated? Yeah, well, uh, so go, go back to when, when I started in recruitment, uh, it was very common for me to call a, a, a company, a potential client, 
and to have to explain to them what a recruitment agency was, what a recruitment agency did. Uh, and and if, if they were, if, if they used me to find candidates, then that would be their first experience of using an agency. So, you know, back in those times, uh, the, the, the book was being written on what recruitment companies do and how they do it. Uh, even though it was, it, the, there have been recruitment agencies around since certainly the 70s and 60s in the UK, but it really blew up. Uh, in the, the the mid to late 80s uh, and as I say a lot of companies were using agencies for the first time uh, and what what we did to find candidates seemed to be kind of a, a black art uh, you know the, the, whenever we knew something and they were surprised that we could learn information about this that and the other where candidates were how much uh, the, the, the going rate for a particular job was and so on and so on and they would say how do you know all these things and we, we would simply uh, say oh you see that's what we're paid to do you know it's a, it's a, it's a secret it's, it's, it's black magic uh, but the, the the truth is is that uh, come, sh jumping forward to today uh, all of the ways in which recruiters uh, employ to, uh, to, to, to track down candidates, to manage pools of candidates, to, uh, to identify someone and then to measure just how good they can be uh, in a particular role. Uh, the cat's out of the bag. Everyone knows how we do it. It's yeah. not a secret anymore. Uh, it, it, you know, it comes down to uh, lateral thinking, hard work, and, and, and just sticking with it uh, and being able to recognize what good looks like. But uh, the magic uh, of, of what recruiters do, anyone could look up, but whether they're inclined to do it or not is a different thing. So, uh, so when, when, when employers use recruitment agencies, uh, it's not that they think something magical is going on, it's they're, they're in full possession of the facts, they know exactly what they're buying. Uh, but one thing that hasn't changed and I really wish had, uh, and I've always wanted this to, to happen, is that going back to 1987, uh, with HMS Recruitment was the company. Uh, it was the biggest network of agencies in the UK. There were maybe a couple of hundred branches. Uh, and I worked in executive appointments for what it's worth in, in Glasgow. Uh, but uh, we charged 20% of someone's salary on, you know, on, on starting the job. Uh, it wasn't a measure of the amount of work that we did. It wasn't a measure of how hard these candidates were to find. It was simply a percentage of the salary. Uh, and the belief, it was a relatively arbitrary way of working out, you know, the, the value of the work that was being done. If someone was earning 40,000, then we would build 20% of that. If, it, if someone was earning 15, it would be 20% of that. Uh, and either exercise could be as hard or harder than the other. Sometimes the, you know, the larger salary job is easier to fill. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. the, 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 the model that we had back then is almost entirely the exact same now. There are RPOs, of course, now, and there are uh, some fixed fee recruiters. Uh, fixed fee recruiters, to, to a large extent, came and not so much went, but they never went anywhere more than they were from uh, maybe five, ten years ago. That's right. But the model of, of billing and recruitment has not changed. And uh, I go back to the year 2000, I, I remember writing a business plan and you know, being absolutely adamant, this will change because it makes no sense. It hasn't changed. I was totally wrong. Uh, and, uh, and of course, employers don't really, they never really did learn to manage recruitment agencies to get the best out of them. It's always been, and I hate to use the word, but uh, it's always been transactional. You do this for me, we do that for you. Uh, this is the fee. Uh, rather than that partnership. Uh, and I always, as a recruiter, I love to be in tight with an employer uh, and be working with them uh, either exclusively or they came to me first or uh, whatever way meant that I had a, a head start on on anyone else trying to, to get that fee. Mm, yeah. A couple of things there. Sorry, 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 sorry. Just, to, just to ask, you said, um, you said that the fee structure hasn't really changed, but you, you wish it would. Mm. Um, what, yeah, why do you wish it would change and, and, and what do you wish it, do you have any ideas of what you want it to be like in an ideal world? So I, I, I worked for an agency back in 1990 called Search Consultancy, uh, which is much bigger now. Uh, but at that time, there was maybe about a dozen staff uh, in Glasgow. And uh, I, I remember winning the first of a few retained assignments where, you know, I, I asked for a proportion of the fee up front and so on. And that locked in the client meant yeah. that that any other agency wouldn't get uh, wouldn't get a sniff of that business, uh, and and it, it freed me up to be an actual recruiter rather than a salesperson 
working against the clock and trying to get you know bums on seat as as, as fast as possible. Uh, so the the retain model was a great way of of stepping forward to uh, to, to securing a tighter relationship with the client. Uh, it was still based on the, that same percentage uh, and not on the amount of uh, of, of uh, time and effort that was involved in that. But over over the time, uh, I would gradually move to uh, to having clients on a on an annual retainer where they would pay a certain amount each month and then pay an additional amount per placement that was made. Uh, and it was much more uh, manageable from the client's point of view uh, because yeah. they, they knew in advance what they were going to be spending over the year or they could project the figures much more accurately uh, and, yeah. and not be caught unawares. And also from, from an agency point of view, it meant that at, on the 1st of January, uh, in advance of the year, we had pretty much locked down X percentage of our annual target. So we knew that that money was safe. So uh, in, in a business yeah, that's yeah. notoriously flighty, uh, where you'll have recruiters who some months don't bill anything, other months bill you know, crazy amounts, uh, having that regular income helps to, to, st to steady things out. Uh, and whilst I don't see, I don't see recruitment consultancies ever going to a, a you know, a, an hourly rate like, uh, you know, accountants and lawyers. Uh, there are a lot of similarities with lawyers, for example. If you were looking at an individual recruitment consultant in an agency, certainly from my perspective, you, you always used to, and I think still can work on the model of, if someone brings in, I don't know, 150,000 pounds in fees in a year, uh, you would reckon on that person taking home a third of that, uh, a third of that would cover your costs and a third of that would be profit for the company. Uh, yeah. Now that would be the ideal. Uh, some recruiters make you more than that, others make you less. Uh, you, you always have some recruiters you take on and they never work out, so you have to cover those costs. Uh, so as an agency owner, you've got to think carefully about uh, how can we uh, regulate and, and moderate the, the, the billing so that we're not caught short in the middle of the year when we don't have any money coming in, but we still have a lot of mouths to feed. Yeah. So just just on that model where you, you get in the the client to pay an ongoing retainer over the course of the year, yeah, um, which I think is sort of brilliant because yeah, for all the reasons you you said, um, how do you I guess put that over to the client in a way that you know they can see how it benefits them and they're willing to do it? Uh, well, the very first thing is is that is that when you're working on a contingency basis, billing twenty maybe thirty percent for, uh, for for fees for for uh, uh, against salaries then built into that contingency is enough money to cover for the assignments that you never made the placement so if you have 20 right. vacancies on and you're only filling maybe eight or ten of them uh, then there are 10 vacancies that you've done work on you didn't get any money for now if you're guaranteed to be filling all of the vacancies for this client or maybe 80 percent then you can afford to reduce the fee amount. So if you can reduce the fee amount for the client, that's that, that straight away, that's the cost saving. Uh, but also more than that, uh, that that's, that's what gets their attention in the first place. But more than that uh, is selling them on the, 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 the big benefits of the recruiter knowing your company intimately, your, your, the recruiter being able to represent your company as your company, uh, to speak with candidates on your behalf authentically, not necessarily as a third party who has, who's, who's somewhere in the middle, but someone who's actually representing your company and someone who knows the types of people who are fitting in with your culture, uh, your, uh, your, 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 your program to grow people through the organization and, uh, uh, and, and your long-term plans for the business. So if you've got a recruiter like that or a company with, you know, a group of recruiters that are working with a particular client, uh, then, uh, and that's more close to the, the, the RPO, RPO model, uh, then, the benefits for the company are that they have a they have a a, a partner that really knows them. Uh, they've cut way down on their their agency spend, uh, and uh, it's, even though they're not still not in a position where they can be doing all the recruitment for themselves. Now, one one thing that recruiters often uh, forget to think about uh, is that well, if we go back to the year two thousand eight, so two thousand eight we had the financial crash in the UK worldwide. Uh, and that meant that uh, loads of agencies in the UK suddenly had far fewer vacancies to work on. Uh, and employers were not recruiting nearly as much as they were, but there was still recruitment going on. Uh, and they brought in uh, loads of agency recruiters as in-housers. 
Uh, now, there's a big relearning model there because suddenly these people are not working on commission anymore, but they bring a lot of their sourcing skills uh, to, uh, to, to the company. Uh, but uh, when companies are recruiting for themselves, then they have a whole, and they have the team in-house in to do that, then they have a whole uh, different set of criteria and targets to hit in terms of not only you know filling the jobs, but filling the jobs successfully and measuring how well that hire did over the first quarter, six months, two years. Uh, and that, that reflects back on the, the, the recruitment team who brought these people on in the first place. Uh, yeah. So the, uh, the, the, the ability of companies to do that for themselves is much more heightened. Uh, and when companies do go out to agencies, uh, and I'm not saying this in every case, but uh, they're going out with the jobs that are harder to fill, the jobs that are more difficult to source, the, uh, and, and the agencies have a tougher job on their hands because the, uh, the, the, the low hanging fruit, the easy to fill vacancies, well, the employers covered those already. Uh, the employers have the same access to all the, all the recruitment tools that uh, agency have, that, that mystery has gone. Uh, but if there are type, uh, particular types of roles that they just can't find this person for that role, then go and spend the money with an agency. Or <clears throat> if they have a time important vacancy to fill, someone's handed their notice in on a Friday and you need that job filled if not on the Monday, then by the following Monday, uh, then much as you might wish not to have to, then paying a premium to get a recruitment agency to find someone uh, in time, uh, it, it could be more cost effective than leaving that job vacant for, uh, for, for the period it takes for you to find someone. Yeah, yeah, fascinating, fascinating. So, so moving on from, from your, your experiences as, as a you know, hands-on recruiter, if you look at, you, you, you see yourself very much now as a, as a job seeker's advocate. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, I couldn't possibly say, but, uh, you know, you, you, you absolutely could. Uh, because it's, it's, it's kind of a cocky thing to say that I, I'm, I'm uh, you know, an advocate for candidates or I'm working on their behalf. No one elected me, no one appointed me. Uh, but uh, in my role with the NORAs, uh, then each year for the past 20 years, uh, we receive over 20,000 nominations from the public for recruitment agencies, uh, job boards uh, and employers. Uh, and we ask candidates for their feedback as well. Now, it, I'd be a liar if I said that each of those 20,000 nominations give us feedback, but maybe on average about 15% do. Uh, mm -hmm. And they'll tell us what they like, what they don't like. Uh, and, and when they're nominating a particular organization, why they're making that, excuse me, that nomination. Uh, so uh, uh, with that information, that informs me as to what candidates are looking for. And as a recruiter, I was always looking at things from a, from a candidate's perspective. Why should they go to this company? Why should they register with this recruitment firm? Uh, what can this recruitment firm do for me that uh, the agency across the road uh, couldn't do? Uh, do they have a, uh, an inside line to the employer I want to get to? Uh, will they represent me well? Uh, uh, are they experts in this field? Uh, so I always wanted candidates to be in a position to choose the recruiter that represented them. Or if they're going direct to employers to, uh, to, to identify the most likely employer that's going to treat them well. Uh, and also knowing, so as a recruiter, I would always prep candidates before an interview. Uh, and, and in my earliest days, I would try and prep my candidates to, to win the interview, to win the job, and to beat the other candidates, even if the other candidates were better for the job. Because I would want my candidate to get the vacancy, because oh. I'd want to get the fee. Uh, but of course, in, in, in truth, it's, it's entirely possible, in fact, it's definitely the case, that some of my candidates got the job when they weren't the best person for the job, simply because I prepped them on the interview to, to do all the things that would that would you know s secure the job yeah. uh, but going beyond that uh, uh, you want candidates to get the right job for the right reasons uh, and again when speaking to candidates if they were going along for an interview or if there was a psychometric assessment for example uh, they say what can I do to prepare myself and I'd say look the best thing that you can do is be be as much yourself as possible. By all means be a heightened version of, your, of yourself you know on your best behavior uh, but if you're taking a a psychometric assessment, for example, and it's trying to read your personality, your character, your, your, the, the traits that you have, then uh, do everything that you can to be the best you possible, you know, in, in, in a good mood, play your favorite music in the car, eat your favorite bar of chocolate or whatever. Uh, but again, 
if you get the job, then you've got the job for all the right reasons because they saw you, uh, rather than pretending it was someone else and getting the job that was actually meant for someone else. It was meant for the person that you brought to the interview, not the person that turns up uh, on day one. Uh, yeah. So in, 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 in candidate terms, uh, they want insight to an organization that's authentic. They want to see hiring managers. They want to understand the organization. They want to know what they're getting into because when a candidate moves from one company, if they leave a secure job, that's a big risk to take. Uh, and they join a new company, they're on uh, you know, a, a probationary period. It might not work out. Uh, they could find themselves in, in the first week or three months really regretting the move or finding out that the employer regrets hiring them. Uh, and it's, it's, it's such a big risk to take that you owe it to yourself to, uh, to, to, to do all your homework beforehand. And remember that any interview situation, it's not them interviewing you as much as it's you interviewing them. It's a two-way street. Uh, so, you know, that, that stage in an interview where the employer says, so do you have any questions? any candidate in the right mind should have a barrel of questions uh, and, uh, you know, ask them in a respectful way, but, you know, you, you, you got to ask, uh, you know, ask the hiring manager. So why do you work here? How long have you worked here? What would, what would it take for you to, for you to leave here? Have you ever considered leaving here? Why should I come? Uh, and uh, why should I seriously consider this? When, when companies say, why should, why should we uh, think about hiring you for this job? Ask the exact same question in return. Why should I come and work here? Uh, what's in it for me? Uh, and not just in a greedy sense, but in, you know, how well do you think you match me? Uh, and, 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 and employers, thankfully, are, are coming around to that and, uh, and know full well that they need to share more about themselves because they know the benefits of getting a, a candidate that's a good culture match. It's a good fit for them. Yeah, yeah. And in view of that, um, the, the, the fact that you've had so much feedback from candidates uh, about recruitment agencies and recruitment companies. What advice would you give to a recruitment agency or company in view of the, the thousands of responses you've had from candidates over the years? Uh, well, uh, the, fir the first thing is to remember whether you're ICI, Disney, uh, Amazon, or Joe Bloggs, the plumbers, if you have a vacancy to fill, then there will you, you will ultimately fill this role with someone uh, and uh, the person you think you need today is not necessarily the person you're going to hire because you know there's the ideal candidate and there's the person that, that you settle on uh, companies yeah. often say we want the best we only hire the best we only hire people who have uh, you know fr from school through university they've, they've only ever been a students and top 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 people uh, we only ever hire those uh, the truth is, is that if, if only top people were ever hired, then the rest of us would be struggling to get by. Uh, because the world is full of ordinary people. Yeah. Uh, and and, and teams, of, uh, teams of players in sport are not all made up of, you know, uh, 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 Maradonas. Uh, you have to have the right person in the right, the right role. And, and often that means that you've got a relatively dull person in the job that calls for a dull person. You've, you've got someone who is a good match for that role, but in other roles would not be. Uh, so uh, employers should always think about uh, uh, making the match uh, for what they need rather than what they think, uh, you know, sh sh should be the, 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 most, the most polished, the most uh, uh, high ranking candidate possible because there can be difficulties in that as well. Uh, and, and with candidates too, uh, candidates should always aim high always aim high, uh, but it's entirely possible that some candidates who are great at interviews can find themselves in a job that's actually beyond their ability. Uh, it, it, people sometimes moan about millennials these days, uh, that they, they, you know, they want to be running the company five minutes after starting. Uh, and, and they don't realize they have to go through, frankly, some of the shitty jobs to get there. Some of the jobs that, that, that involve uh, really learning in detail about you know, what's involved uh, uh, to make this company work, all aspects of it. Uh, so when people are, uh, are, are on their bones, uh, they need to appreciate that they're getting somewhere. And in any organization, candidates need to be aware that they're making progress, that they're a bit further along the road today than yesterday. Uh, it's not necessarily that they're working up, everyone's working up to be managing director because there's only one MD role in, the, in, in, in each company, uh, but uh, that 
they are becoming more valuable uh, to themselves, to the company, uh, and if it came to it, to moving on elsewhere. Uh, and when, it, when you work in recruitment for a long time, you understand the recruitment market and the HR uh, sector more than most. And you know that people do move on. Uh, you know that people will leave. Uh, companies are much more switched on these days to, I was going to say let people go. It's not as if they have a choice, but but people moving on from them and moving on on good terms in a sense that potentially some way down the line, they might come back or they might, wherever they go, they might become a client in the future or they might become a supplier in the future. Uh, some enlightened recruitment agencies uh, in, the, in the past 15, 20 years, whenever they've had a great recruiter leaving, uh, they've said, look, we really don't want to lose you, but we understand you want to go and set up your own company. Uh, can we invest in your new company? And that's happened with a couple of, a couple of big, I think the, uh, the S3 group, uh, progressive recruitment uh, that happened with, and it's, it's relatively uh, common where that can happen, uh, where uh, 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 an individual recruiting consultant wants to go and work for themselves. Because let's face it, when you're working as a recruiter, you're kind of a self-contained business uh, for the most part, if you're working in perm recruitment. Uh, so uh, when you're making fees for someone else, inevitably you're going to think, well, I could be making these fees for myself and building up my own company. Uh, but an enlightened employer that would see you getting to the stage and you know, looking to go and do that might say, well, uh, we'd like to have a stake in your future success. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's, an, that's an interesting point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll just, sorry, Joe, I just got another question just really quick. I've got so many questions. Excuse me. The, yeah. Your, your NORA organization and the NORA event, you mentioned this is the 20th anniversary. Can you tell us when the next, when the, when the next one is, the, uh, the next event is please, and just a bit about that, and then I'll yep. let you just a second, I'll just, uh, I'm getting this done because this, this, is, this is a wooden NORA that we gave away in 2013. 2013, unlucky for some, uh, that was the 13th one, and uh, that year, the only year, uh, we decided to give it an award for the, for the worst uh, job board. Uh, we only did it once and it, was, uh, it, it maybe wasn't a good idea, but uh, the, re the reason I'm holding that up, and, and uh, it, it, was, it was won by the DWP website uh, for, uh, for job seekers. Needless to say, they didn't come and collect the award. That's <laughs> why I have it here. Uh, but the wooden Nora uh, was, was identifying the worst, and, 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 and really that's not what the Nora's about. The Nora's about identifying the very best uh, and and the, the companies and organizations who, <clears throat> in the notice, who are shortlisted as finalists in the first place and who win, uh, we are not saying that these are definitively, absolutely, measurably the very best. What we're saying is that these are examples of the best to our, the best extent that we can find out. And it's an open competition uh, where, you know, there are no fees for entering, uh, the, the public can nominate, often companies are nominated without them making any submission at all, so you, they only find out they've been shortlisted as a finalist when we contact them. Uh, but uh, with the NORAs, we try and identify the very best examples so that everyone else can have something to, uh, to, to, to aim for. Uh, they know what good looks like. They can see, well, that's what award worthy would be. That's what candidates are looking for. Uh, and we try and identify that so that uh, there's an example there for others to, uh, to, to, to follow on. Not, not, not necessarily to copy, but in large part of the view. Uh, yeah. But if you look at the companies that are winners over the past 20 years, uh, then for the most part, those companies have gone on to do amazing things. Some have not succeeded, but that's business. Uh, but uh, in the 20 years of the NORAs, there have been, I think, 423 separate uh, finalists and winners in the NORAs. And they're all, they're all what we call members of the, the NORA Academy. Uh, there's an award that we have each year where the Academy members get to vote themselves for the, 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 the online recruitment uh, uh, website that they think is the best that year. So that's the only one that's actually voted for by the Academy members. Uh, the others are nominated by the public and voted for uh, by our judging panels. Uh, we have two judging panels. One decides who the finalists are going to be uh, of all the nominations, and the next decides of those finalists who the winners are going to be. Uh, and, and again, the judges are all given the task of, of, of assessing websites from a candidate's perspective. The judges are all experienced in HR or recruitment or, uh, you know, or, or on, online technology. Uh, but they're all given the task to, to look at it from a, a candidate's perspective. Yeah, excellent. And, and yeah. When, is, when is the event? 
So the, the event this year will be in November. I think it's November the 13th, 14th. I'll double check. Uh, but uh, it's always the second week in November every year. Uh, and uh, the nominations process begins uh, mid-July. Uh, so we ask the public to start nominating in July. And uh, 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 as I say, it goes through that, that, that period. We have uh, 13 awards in total. Each of the awards, uh, in order to, uh, to, to, to make sure that it's possible, each of the awards we have uh, sponsors for. I'm just going to show you. There's a, you can see some of our uh, sponsors there for, uh, uh, for last year. Uh, you might also see down there, there's a, a poster for RecX. There's an event that we run also called RecX, which is Recruitment Explained. It's part of the Noro Academy. And, uh, and RecX uh, is an event where it's a bit like TED Talks for recruitment. Uh, yeah. we, uh, we, we look for speakers who are passionate and experienced in the world of HR and recruitment. Uh, not necessarily very experienced speakers that you'll see on the circuit regularly. In fact, we, we deliberately make, make a point of trying to find people who have never spoken before. But we want people who can give a really tight, passionate 15 minute talk uh, on, uh, on an area of employment and recruitment that will, you know, will really engage with the audience, not only in the room, but we, we, we film all the talks as well. So you'll see, uh, you'll see RecX talks on the website, recx.net. Uh, and uh, we've had events uh, in uh, multiple events in London, uh, with an event in Lisbon uh, last year and in Austin in uh, September last year. We have another one coming up uh, at uh, the Unleash uh, conference is in partnership with TA Tech, uh, so that's on the 24th of March this year, uh, and there'll be another one after that in Vegas. And as I say, essentially it's TED Talks for recruitment, uh, not the kind of talk that you would typically see or presentation you would typically see at other events where people are talking about the most topical things, you know, or, or you know how to how to get the best out of LinkedIn or you know what ATS is the best to use and so on. But someone yeah. who really gives a deep insight to what they do. And it might be an employer uh, who's won a Nora talking about what they did to become award worthy, uh, they, to give an insight to their organization that you just wouldn't get elsewhere, uh, yeah. to let people have a peek behind the curtain if you like. Uh, so that's, that's, that's Rec X for you. Excellent, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know you were involved in that actually. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Sorry, sorry Drew, go on with you. Um, yeah, Stephen, just going back to the the uh, Nora Awards, mm. um, typically, you know, if you look back all, at all the previous winners and, and finalists, what are you and the judges looking for? Are there any sort of, sort of top three criteria that someone listens to this now to make those changes and, you know, put themselves in a good position to win? Uh, yes. Uh, the So the, the, one of the things I often say is that, is, is that we're judging entirely from a candidate's perspective. So for example, with a job board, uh, if, you, if, you, if you offer great value for money to your advertisers, we're not interested because candidates have no knowledge yeah. of that. They don't know how much it costs to advertise on a uh, job site or total jobs. Uh, candidates are looking for, uh, uh, well, first things first, they're looking for the ideal job and they're looking for the quickest way to get there and the most seamless experience possible. Uh, and it might be that some website has all the bells and whistles that, you know, the, is, is all the features are there and it feels great to, to, to use. Some other sites are really simple and you get straight to what you're looking for as quickly as possible. Uh, but uh, in essence, what we're looking for each website to be is as appropriate as possible for the audience. So if it's a niche job board, we want that niche job board to be giving insight, not just to the vacancies, but also to that specific uh, recruitment market, uh, whether it be an accountancy yeah. or marketing or, or, or whatever. If it's, a, if it's a small agency, we expect them to have front and foremost uh, details on recruiters that work there. I want, I want candidates to be able to search for the recruiter that's best for them. Uh, if it's a larger agency, that might be more difficult to do, but I really want you to humanize the website to differentiate yourself from job boards. There used to be a, a, a pattern of agencies trying to build their website to look like a job board uh, when that's the last thing they should look like. There should be vacancies on there, but uh, they need to offer and deliver that extra service. Uh, and job boards, they need to be as comprehensive as possible. They need to be uh, if you're a generalist job board, uh, you need to have a very high number of vacancies on there. You need to cover, uh, you know, all the, uh, the the different types of vacancies that there are and be totally easy to use on any device, especially on these. Everyone everyone gets alerts on their smartphone. And when you click an alert on the smartphone, 
uh, it opens up in, uh, in, in a small screen. So if you can't read and, and uh, view vacancies on a small screen and make your application, then what's the point? Uh, yeah. So you know, all of those things, what we are looking for, certainly in the past couple of years more so, is that candidates can get that insight to the vacancy. So right now, obviously, I, I would say that one of the best ways of doing that, and it's not the only, but one of the best, is to do it by video. So companies should be sharing the hiring manager talking about the job, talking about the, the reason the vacancy is, is there, the prospects for someone in the role, why they should be interested in, in, in making an application for this role. Video content, by far and away, is the best way of refining the caliber of candidates that are applying. If you're, if you're finding you're getting lots of irrelevant candidates uh, applying for jobs and you then make a, a video job advert, you'll find that candidates self-select themselves really accurately. So the bad candidates or the irrelevant candidates won't apply nearly as much. Uh, and many more passive candidates who were never applying at all before are now thinking, I can see the hiring manager. I could work for that guy or that woman. Uh, I could see myself working yeah. in that organization. If you can see on video the diversity in any workplace, then you can, for yourself, you can think, yeah, there's people there just like me. I could, I could get on with those people. That's the place I could work in. So video is a great way to do that. Without, without spelling out your diversity, you can literally demonstrate it on video. So uh, that kind of thing. So the, in, in terms of instructions to our judges, we tell them to look at everything from a candidate's perspective and to be fussy uh, in the same way that candidates will be in looking for, for, for uh, information on jobs and whether they should apply or not. Uh, and, and, and of course, if you're one business over another, you need to differentiate yourself. Uh, you can't just be the, same, be the same as every other agency or employer or job board in terms of how you present what you're presenting to people online to, to make an application. Yeah, yeah, some really good points there, actually. Brilliant. Yes, really good points. Thank you. And, and, and in terms of um, just moving away from, from, from Nora now, just give us a, an overview of, uh, you know, we're coming to the end now, of, of uh, video, my jobs, and who that benefits and, and how that works, please, Stephen. Uh, well, video, my job uh, is a company based in Melbourne, in Australia. Uh, I'm, I'm the only person with the company outside of uh, Australia, uh, but uh, that, that, will, that will change soon. There'll be more people. Uh, but uh, So I was uh, full-time with Video My Job last year. Uh, this year, uh, there's a couple of other things that I'm doing as well. Uh, but uh, Video My Job is essentially it's, it's a, it's a, uh, a product and a service that largely lives on apps on your smartphone, uh, whether it's Android or, uh, or Apple. Uh, and it enables employers to in turn enable their staff to generate video content that can be used for uh, job adverts uh, or uh, employer branding videos or marketing videos and the internal engagement videos, engaging with candidates through the hiring process by uh, communicating with, with them through video content and of course on, onboarding and training. So there's, there's 101 uses, but uh, the company was initially started on the basis of making video job adverts uh, and in the app itself you can record yourself directly uh, you can uh, uh, have a there, there's a built-in auto uh, sorry teleprompter uh, where you have a script on what you want to say so you can be looking directly at the candidate in the camera without having to do this the whole time to check your notes uh, and and again you can have uh, a text appearing on screen you can have images appearing on screen you can have video in video on screen, uh, you can get really quite creative with it, uh, and and we work really closely with huge organisations worldwide uh, to make sure that that the candidates are getting that insight that they're looking for, uh, yeah. and that candidates are engaged through the entire process. Uh, uh, people often talk about ghosting these days, where candidates they might start an application, uh, but they fade away because the employer, frankly wasn't keeping a hold of them. Uh, video is a great way to engage with candidates and, and, and maintain a conversation from the very beginning, uh, uh, right through to when someone, someone joins. Uh, and as I say, authenticity is absolutely the, uh, the, the, the key word in all of that. Right, excellent, excellent. And people listening to this, how can, how can people reach out to you, be it for Nora, be it for Video My Job, be it wherever, how can, uh, our clients and, and, and you know, yeah, people in the business look out, reach out to you. I am uh, always very, people say too much, I, I'm very busy on uh, social media. So you'll, you'll, you'll see me on LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Facebook. Uh, I, uh, I, one thing I didn't touch on, uh, along with Louise Trines, uh, with uh, Recruiter Zone, uh, we have a channel where we're making uh, webcast videos on a, a weekly basis. 
uh, live webcast videos talking about everything to do with recruitment and with experts and all, all the different fields. So on Crowdcast, Recruiter Zone, on anything else for me directly, uh, you would find it under Stephen O'Don, the two ends. Uh, so Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, and uh, certainly the websites uh, at nurauk.com and uh, uh, videomyjob.com and recx.net. Fantastic. And from your point of view, Brilliant. you've no objection to people reaching out to you and connecting with you on... Oh, oh, please, please, absolutely. Uh, uh, one of the things that I love doing, uh, and obviously you, you need to balance your time, but uh, anyone who's looking for a bit of uh, help or guidance or advice, whether it be recruiters or startup tech companies, then I'm more than happy to have a conversation. If I can help, I will do. Uh, if I can point someone in the right direction, then I'm more than keen to do that. Uh, what, what's the point in having 30 odd years experience in recruitment if you can't share it a little? Oh, that's very generous and very good of you, Stephen. Excellent, excellent. And I know, we, we know Louise that well, actually. You can tell Louise this. She was one of our, she, we've interviewed Louise, who's been on our podcast uh, previously. I and, saw it. Uh, you saw it, yeah. And yeah. she's she's been one of, one of our most popular guests. So please tell her that. She uh, went down very well with, with our audience. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, must, I must reach out to again. I have to say, I mean, you, you've both been very good, by the way, Stephen. I know. <laughs> if I could be a fraction as popular as Louise, then I think I'd be do, doing pretty well. <laughs> Yeah, that was excellent, Stephen. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, very welcome. Really appreciate that. And of course, Drew, thank you very much for uh, for joining us today. A day. Well, <laughs> my words out. Thank you very much for joining us. Good day. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so that's that's the gin I'm drinking. So this is Terry Edwards, Renegade Recruiter. Until next time, take care, take action, and be relentless. Thanks a lot, Stephen. Take care. Bye bye.